Hello friends! Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Fiona and I am a full-time artist and on this channel I like to take you with me on my artistic journey, whether that means working on projects here in my studio, going out and seeing cool exhibitions, buying art supplies and sharing my haul with you, or discussing art topics like we are going to do today. A few weeks ago I participated in the other art fair. I'll leave the vlog in the description below if you want to check that out but I was receiving questions about what is it like to be in an art fair if I have any suggestions for anyone that's going to be participating in one so I wanted to make a video about my art fair process so this is going to be a long video and what I did is I made my personal checklist and I've left a link in the description below if you want to download it and print it off for yourself I hope it will be helpful Obviously, this is not like a full comprehensive on art fairs. It's just my own personal checklist and things that I go through when I'm thinking about participating in one and what goes into it. Um, so I hope that you find that helpful. And yeah, feel free to click the link, download that. And also artists, if you have participated in art fair yourself, please leave a comment below. That's where the best conversations happen and we can discuss what it's like to be in an art fair there. So. Let's get into it. I would say there are four phases to an art fair, which is the application process, pre-fair, at fair, and post-fair. So in this video, I'm not going to get too deep into the application process because honestly, the application process is very different depending on what fair you are actually applying to. But what I can tell you in general, what you will need is an artist statement, which is a description about your work your artist bio, which is a description about you, your portfolio. So it should be images that are similar to what you would be considering showing and your resume. So they want to know what other shows you've been in, if you've been in any other fairs. But overall, you need to read through the application requirements very carefully, make sure that you're doing it all correctly, because you can be rejected off of something as simply as having the wrong image format, speaking from experience. With that said, let's get into the rest of it. Okay, I have my list. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is the pre-fair preparations, uh, because that is going to be the most, is everything that you're doing to prepare for the event itself. But the very first thing on the list that I suggest you do is set your intentions or goals or expectations, whatever you wanna call it. It will really affect your approach and your booth hang uh, if you know what, what's your goal. What are you trying to get out of the fair? So a lot of people automatically assume it's to sell work, right? Because you want to make back the investment that you put into getting the booth to begin with. But a lot of people go into it looking to get gallery representation, to grow their mailing list. And there's a variety of reasons that an artist might be participating outside of selling. So I would say figure out what your goals are for the fair and that's like gonna change everything about how you approach it. So the second thing I have on the list is booth curation. So what I just said before, for instance, about setting your intentions. If your intention is to sell your artwork, you're going to have a variety of sizes and prices available, whereas if you're trying to get gallery representation, you might have a very minimal hang, very large works. The price might not be as accessible to the average buyer, but it's going to grab a lot of attention and might get the notice of galleries. Also, overall, with your booth curation, you want to know the size of your booth and you want to plan it out ahead of time. The last thing you want to do is show up day of and you might have four hours to hang this thing and you have no idea what you're going to do. You want to go in with a plan so know the size of your booth, know the size of your works, and maybe just even lay it out on the floor in your studio, just measure it out, sort of know what works going next to each other, what body of work do you even wanna be showing? Because you want your booth to have a cohesive look and feel. I have done a booth hang before where I've had two different bodies of work and it really did confuse potential buyers. They didn't understand why were they so different? Am I the same artist as these two artists? So um, personally, what I found for me, one body of work, very cohesive, 
a range of sizes in that body of work. And that opens up the buyers to understanding that this is one artist and this is what the work is about. Um, and then for you, for your booth curation, you're gonna go in with a plan and you'll also know outside of the hang itself, um, do you need a shelf for pieces? Most recently I showed ceramics and it was the first time I brought a shelf with me. So I knew that I wanted to install that, but then I wanted smaller works above it. So I had that in my booth curation. Uh, I also know I wanted a table and I had um, my <laughs> drawing rack with me. So I kind of had that all sketched out. For me, I actually photoshopped it together with photos of my work so I could kind of visualize it. But sometimes a sketch just works. Something so that you know when you go in, what am I going to do? And it helps you figure out what other things you need to buy, um, such as, like I said, shelf, um, table, rack, if you need a chair, and any furniture that you might need. Maybe you show sculptures, so you need pedestals. Um, doing your booth curation is going to help you figure all of that out. Okay, so number three I have here is prep work for display. So this might be something that you don't think about because maybe your work is already ready to go, but for me, I'll make work and I might not add a hang system till after it's sold or until I know it's going into a show or something. So make sure if you have canvases, you have a hanging system on the back. If you need to get paperworks framed, um, do that as soon as possible. So you give the framer plenty of time to do it. Sometimes frame shops can take up to three weeks. If you're going to frame it yourself, go out and buy those frames, buy your hanging systems and start putting stuff together. Um, cause it might seem like a small thing that you could do maybe a few days before the fair, but it actually takes quite a bit of time. It's also a money commitment on front on your part if you're going to be doing it yourself. So something to think about that you need to get done ahead of time. So the fourth thing I have on my list is to prepare backup works. So what do I mean by backup works? If you are in your booth day one, and let's say you sell two things. Now you have two blank spots on your wall. Some people like the approach of leaving a blank wall because it gives that sort of buzzy, hey, look, I'm selling. But for me, I like to have backup pieces. And then each new day I come into the fair, I will put new works up. So for each piece that I hang, I will try to have a backup for that if I have something in a similar size. Um, so you need to also prepare those with frames and hanging systems because you don't want to come back from day one of the fair selling two things and then go, oh, I don't have anything ready to replace it. So try and get on top of that ahead of time and it'll save you a lot of trouble in the, during the fair itself if you have that ready. And then the last thing that you're gonna have to do for your works is to create labels. This might depend on the type of fair you're participating in, but I would say most fairs require that you have a label. So that'll include the title of the piece, year made, materials used, and the price. So most fairs require you to include the price. This makes people uncomfortable sometimes, but honestly, it's going to make the selling a lot easier. People are there to buy work anyway, so they can go up, see what it costs, get into a discussion with you if it's something that they think is affordable for them. So you want to create all those labels, have them cut out, ready to go, and um, a bit of tacky or tape so you can stick it on the wall right next to it. Uh, and if you're doing an outdoor fair, um, I have not done one where I've had one of those grids where you can do that. So, hey, any of you artists that have done an outdoor fair, comment below and let us know how you display your labels, but I'm guessing it's a similar thing that you need to have um, name, size, materials, price, all of that. So potential buyers know what they're getting into. Speaking of which, on your labels, you should also include your social media handle because a lot of people will be taking photos but never actually grab your business card. And this way they can follow up with you after and find out who you are and potentially tag you. And on that same topic, how we just talked about backups, you also need to have that for your labels because I have done that before where I've had backup work ready to go. And then the morning of woke up being like, okay, I'm gonna replace this piece and went, Actually, I don't have a label for that. And I've had to quickly type it up, print it, cut it out. So 
just have those ready to go. And once again, it saves you a bit of a, a last minute rush the morning of. So we've been talking about printing things. So the other thing you need to create and print are promotional materials. So that can be your business cards. Maybe you have postcards of an upcoming show. Maybe you want to make little thank you cards if somebody does buy something. Uh, you want to create and get all of those printed out. Business cards are a very important piece that you need to have at the fair because even people who may not buy something from you will pick up your business card and they might hold on to it, connect with you later about a potential piece, follow you on your social media, subscribe to your newsletter. So you want to make sure you have those business cards. On average for a four day fair, I think I go through about maybe 100 business cards a day. So I would get maybe 500 to be on the safe side and that should cover you for the weekend and you'll have a few extra if you have anything after the fact. And on that same topic, um, you're gonna want something that you can put your business cards in so people can grab them. I use a little ceramic dish, but some people just have a little stand and you can just grab those out of there. So something easy you can pick up off of Amazon or from Staples. Moving on, you will need a mailing list capture. The very first fair I did, I didn't even have a mailing list, but I brought a notebook with me and I wrote on it name, email address, you know, thank you for visiting my booth. Please leave your name and email below if you would like to be added to my mailing list. And I think I got about 50 emails that first fair and I actually started my mailing list as a result of that. So don't stress too much if you don't have a mailing list yet, but if you're participating in a fair, I suggest starting your email capture so then when you eventually make one, you can add these people to it. Um, some people do really fun things like a giveaway saying if you drop your business card in this jar or leave your name and email below, you'll be submitted into uh, a small print giveaway. And sometimes that entices more people to leave their emails. Just like before when I talked about setting intentions, when that's some people's goal, doing the giveaway really entices people to leave their information. Um, but overall, I would say just having something to capture people's email on. So whether it's a notebook, just a sheet of paper with some lines on it where it says name, email address, or a tablet. A tablet would be great because sometimes, this has happened to me, people will write and I can't understand their handwriting and sometimes I don't get the right email address because of that. Um, something to keep in mind. So if you have a tablet, that might be a fun way to capture it and then you know you have people's right email address. So the next piece that you're going to have to do is advertise that you will be at the fair. So you'll want to let people know on social media, you'll want to send out a newsletter if you have a mailing list, um, send emails, send texts, make sure that you get in contact with previous collectors because this is a really good opportunity for them to come see your latest stuff and potentially buy. But just connect with people however you can. Just make sure whenever you're talking about it, date, location, and if they need to get tickets, let them know how. Uh, in the case of the other art fair, they give us complimentary codes. So I try to share that with all my collectors to let them know that they can get free tickets. And sometimes that entices them more to come along. So the next thing you're going to have to figure out is the logistics around the fair. So if you are not local to the fair, you need to figure out how are you getting there? And how is your artwork getting there? Uh, in terms of yourself, if you are local, you can drive there, you can get a train, you can get a bus. Just know that you're going to be carting a lot of your work with you. Um, my suggestion would be to rent a car if you don't have one. I've done it before where I've carpooled with a fellow artist where I've rented a van and we've both got our stuff in there and then saved a bit of money and we were able to go together. Uh, in general, now I have a car where I can fit the work and I'm able to transport it. Uh, but if you are not local, you might need to look into a shipping courier. You might want to look into options for how would you travel with art. Maybe you have a portfolio that you can check in on a flight. And when you arrive, you do all your framing ahead of time. So you'll need logistically, you will need to know I'm arriving early and I need to go buy frames and I need to put those frames together or perhaps you're mailing it to a framer who then is mailing it to someone at the location you can pick it up from. 
There's a lot of different ways to do this, but you will logistically need to figure out how are you getting yourself there and how are you getting your work there? So have that plan ready to go. As well as, is anyone coming with you for your setup and breakdown? I recommend bringing uh, a friend or if you need to hire somebody to help you, uh, helps take the edge off. Somebody can hold work up while you're hammering and nailing things. Just something to think about that you might not wanna be doing it on your own. It's good to have a helping hand. Something else you need to determine is where are you staying? So once again, if you're not local and you can drive to and from there every day, you will need to figure out an Airbnb or a hotel. Something to consider is, are there other artists traveling from far away and are they somebody that you could potentially share uh, an Airbnb with or a hotel room if you're comfortable with doing that. Next thing, figure out how sales work. At the fair, will there be a till that everybody gets rung up at? And are there sales dockets that they all need to figure out? I bring this up because that's how other art fair does it, but I will be participating in another fair called Superfine this September, and they have already told us that you will be running your own sales. So now I know I need a square reader or something where I can run people's credit card uh, on my own. So you want to figure out for your fair, are you running sales yourself or is the fair doing it for you? And how does that all work? And whether you need to order any sort of special equipment, a tablet, will these things work with your phone? Um, Sure, you could do PayPal, you could do Venmo. You just need to know how are you going to run sales. So these last four points are things that you'll need to do in basically the week of the fair. And I would say the first thing is wrap your pieces, make sure they're ready to transport. And this is in the case is if you've not already shipped it. If you're working with a shipping courier, you don't have to worry about this. But if you're someone like me that transports the work myself, I have to make sure all the work is nice and bubble wrapped and ready to transport so nothing gets damaged while it is being took to the booth. You will also need to put together a toolbox. So when you arrive on site, most of these fairs request that you put together your booth yourself. And some of them might have requirements for the walls. So although art fair does not let you use a hammer and nails, you have to use screws and they have to be a certain size. So I buy the specific screw that they have mentioned and then I bring an electric screwdriver to save myself a bit of trouble. Uh, you'll need a level so you make sure that everything's even, measuring tape so you can measure everything out, a pencil, um, tape to put your labels up after, scissors because you might need to, you know, cut things out last minute. So there's a whole host of things that you will need in your toolbox. Comment below if you want specifically my list of everything I bring and I can leave it in the comments for y'all. Going back to advertising, you need to send a week of reminder. So you wanna send out a little note, whether it's on social media, your news list saying, hey guys, the fair is happening this week because your first advertisements might be a month out and the weeks leading up, but the week of you really want to let people know. So I usually send out uh, a message on Monday, letting people know, hey, the fair is starting on Thursday through Sunday. And it kind of gives people time to plan for that week. And then on social media, I will actually post every day, um, reminding people about it. And then obviously when I'm at the fair as well. And then the last thing I suggest you do, which is completely optional, but something I have found for my own comfort is put together some snacks and food, bring water or whatever drinks that you wanna have during the fair, just for your own comfort. And I also uh, plan all my outfits. This might seem inconsequential to you, but for me, when I wake up in the morning, I can have a hard time deciding what to wear. So I just pick out the four outfits for the day, have them ironed, hanging, and that way I don't even think about it. In the morning, I can just grab it and throw it on and go. All right, you've done it. You're all prepared for the fair and now you are there. Your booth is hung and ready to go. A few things that you should do before the fair actually opens. Fingers crossed you've given yourself like an hour or two to relax before the fair opens. Uh, I would suggest a few things, which is make friends with your booth mates because you'll be helping each other out throughout the entire fair. You'll be talking to each other when things are a little bit downtime or things are slow. Um, if one of you has to go to the bathroom, you'll say, hey, I'm running to the bathroom, can you man my booth? And you do the same for them. 
So it's nice to just introduce yourself, get to know them. If there's someone there with them to help them hang it, introduce yourself to them. And in general, it's a part of the fair experience is just getting to know other artists. So take some time, introduce yourself to them, uh, as well as the fair staff. So if you see the staff walking around, just take a minute, introduce yourself to them. You've probably been, you've probably been communicating with them through email. So it's just nice to introduce yourself so they have a face to the name, say hello, and um, you know, say you're excited and ready to go. The other thing I would suggest is take photos and videos of your booth at this time. For me, once the fair gets underway, I, I'm purely focused on talking to people and manning my booth that taking time to take photos and videos is not really at the top of my mind. So try to document it ahead of time and then that way you have photos to post later and just in general for future fairs, if you're applying to other ones, you can show them your booth hang and things like that. It's always good to document shows that you're in. And then the last thing I would do is post that you're there on your social media and say, hey, we're here and we're ready to kick off. I hope to see you guys. Okay, now the fair is open. On my trusty list here, I have drink water, eat snacks, take breaks. These are all things that you should do. It'll just make you feel a lot more comfortable. But I don't have it on the list here. So if you want to take some notes, feel free to. But I'm going to talk a little bit about at the fair sales technique. So I didn't make this into a checklist because it's not something you'll be sitting there checking off as you're doing. It's just something that maybe you want to consider or think about ahead of the fair or while you're there, how you're going to approach people and how you're gonna make sales. So here's a bit about how I do it. The first thing you wanna do is think about how are you going to greet people that are in your booth? For me, if uh, I see people walk in, I just go over and I go, hi, my name is Fiona, I'm the artist. Let me know if you have any questions about the work. And people are usually like, okay, thank you. And I step back, let them browse. Uh, cause it's this space between, you don't want to seem like over eager sales associate. Uh, but you also don't want people wandering in there being like, well, where's the artist? I have a question. So you just say, hi, I'm the artist. Let me know if you have any questions. And then they know it, when they see you, if they have a question, they'll, they'll wave you down or look at you. Um, if they don't, then they can grab a card. They can move on. No big deal. So if somebody's spending quite a bit of time in your booth uh, and they seem interested, you can go over and say, oh, did you have any questions about that particular piece you're looking at? Or is there anything I can help you with? And usually this will be begin a conversation. Sometimes I'm just standing back and the people wave me over and I come over and I say, yes, do you have any questions? And, you know, let them lead it. Uh, if people will say, oh, can you tell me more about this piece? It's good to know sort of an elevator pitch overall for your work. So this is just two or three quick sentences about you, about your work that help them get an idea of what it is that you have on display. So if you're having a hard time conceptually shrinking down what your work is about. I know it can be really tough when you have sort of big ideas. How do I express that in just a few sentences? What I would suggest is you could start with how it's made. That's usually really easy to introduce people to where if someone's looking at a piece, I'll go, oh, well, that piece is uh, acrylic on canvas. It was made over a three week period. Um, just start describing the work and how it was made and sometimes that's like an easier entry point than saying oh this body of work is about the concept of joy and how people have been experiencing that over the last year in isolation like sometimes that's harder for people to understand sometimes it's more simple to start with how it's made so once you're done with your elevator pitch like i said two or three sentences really be an active listener with the buyer so listen to the things that they're saying and try to address that. So if they're talking about something for their home, be like, oh, where are you thinking about hanging a piece in your home? Or did you just move somewhere new and you're looking for artwork for your home? Uh, or in general, you can just straight up ask, oh, are you interested in buying artwork for your home? Sometimes people will be talking about a gifting opportunity. You could be, oh, who are you gifting this for? Oh, does that person have a favorite type of art? Oh, do they have a particular color that they like? What type of space would they be looking for a piece in? So 
actively listen because you can't make the assumption that you know what somebody will be doing with your work and um, it can help you secure a sale. A lot of the time you'll talk with somebody and then they'll say, okay, well, I need to make a round and think about it because they, they're at a fair, there's a lot of other artists to see, so they might wanna walk around and do a little comparison in terms of sizing, pricing between you and another artist. Uh, but if you see somebody come back around, definitely take that as an opportunity to speak to them again. Say, oh, hi, welcome back. Is this a piece you're still thinking about? Is there anything that I can give you more information about it? Uh, but you'll also have people that are like, okay, well, I'm just not sure to buy right now. You can say, well, why don't you take one of my business cards or sign up for my mailing list and you can find out when I have new works available or when I'm going to have new shows and have them fill out their information. There's also an opportunity potentially for commission where people might say, wow, I really like this piece, but like the size of it just isn't right. I need something bigger or I want something in a different format. Um, so what you can do is I have a separate sheet under my mailing list that's for commissions. And I'll just say, well, how about you leave your name and email and I'll follow up with you after and we can start a conversation about a commission. And then sometimes people do that and I'll make a little note after they walk away saying, you know, Kate from Brooklyn looking for a larger size piece that looks like this work. And just a note so I remember when I can email them and follow up, I'll have an image attached saying, hey, you really like this piece, but you're looking for it in a different format. And I just wanted to start discussing that with you. So even if people are just taking photos of your work and looking at it, um, always be like, hey, take a business card, follow me on Instagram, just you know, try to promote yourself that way because you never know when somebody could become a potential buyer. So the last thing I'll say about being at the fair is try to relax. Um, I know it can seem stressful and I've had fairs where I've sold nothing for three days and then finally sold 10 things on the last day. So try to relax. Don't try to compare yourself to other people there. Just be in your own moment. Um, try to really engage with people about your work and there's more that can come out of it than purely sales. Yes, you've done the fair, woo! And now you're in the post-fair follow-up, so you're not done yet. Going back to my sheet here, post-fair, um, thank you emails. So anybody that has purchased a piece, however big or however small, send them a thank you. Just say, hi, so-and-so, really nice meeting you at the fair. Thank you for purchasing, title of the piece. Uh, I really hope that you love it. I'm sure I'll be very happy in your home. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And now the most important thing is you leave how they can continue to connect with you. Say, if you would like to stay in touch, please follow me on my newsletter where I announce shows I'll be at and new collections that I launch. Or you can follow me on social media here and leave links to your social media. Um, and it just lets people know that you want to have that relationship with them, that they've bought a piece from you, but that it's not like you just buy it and say, okay, thank you. Bye. You're, you have a relationship with them now. It means a lot that they have a piece of yours in their home, or perhaps they thought it was so nice that they want to gift it to a friend of theirs. So you don't just want to let that connection die off. You want to stay in touch with them. Now, all the newsletter signups that you got make sure you add them as soon as possible into your subscription list. So that way, when you send up your post fair email newsletter, you get to say, thanks for coming. If you're new to this list, that must mean I met you at the event. It was so much fun. Thank you for coming and stopping by my booth. Here's works that are still available and, you know, include a few pieces with links to shop it. And then speaking of works that are available, you will want to share in your social media saying, wow, the fair was so amazing. Um, so thankful for people that purchased pieces. It was such a great time. Talk about it a little bit, but then say, here's some works that are still available in my online shop or, you know, in the case of all the art fair, we have Saatchi. So just post links to it, photos of it, and let people know who maybe don't live nearby, weren't able to make the fair what's still available and maybe you'll get some post-fair uh, sales that way. And then finally, the last thing you need to do is rest and recharge. <laughs> you will be very tired after doing the fair. So if it is possible for yourself, give yourself 
a day, two, maybe three to just rest, recharge, smile and be happy. <laughs> so that was all of my list. But I did ask on social media whether you guys had any specific questions about fairs. So I'm going to do a little Q&A right now. Okay, the first question I have is, how to apply for art fair? What is their criteria for selection? Can any artist be a part of fairs? Um, so I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the video, but all art fairs are really different depending on what one you are trying to apply to. So one of the first things I do when I'm looking to apply for a particular fair is I'll look if they even accept individual artists. Many fairs only accept you if you are gallery represented or you are a part of an artist collective. So whatever one you're particularly looking at, I would look into whether they accept artist individuals. Or if you are part of a collective or a gallery represented, then it's something that maybe you're able to consider. If they take individual artists, I will look at the location, dates, and the cost associated with doing the fair and figure out whether it's something that I am able to do. And if it's something that I'm not quite able to swing at that time, I will perhaps bookmark it and plan it for the following year and put it on my calendar. So I know when applications open and close and I can kind of be prepared for that. Uh, and you asked about criteria. So I had said at the start, depends on the fair, but in general, having that artist statement, artist bio, resume and portfolio of images of your work ready to go in general that is what any will require um some specific fairs like i think um spring break art fair they want you to do like a proposal of like what sort of installation you'll do in the booth um and then some i know they might want letters of recommendation from people so maybe having somebody in mind that could write a recommendation for you uh, it really differs depending on the fair. Also something to keep in mind that say you get rejected from a fair, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's it, you'll never get into it. I would suggest trying to apply it again. A lot of these fairs switch out the judges every time that they are doing the fair and that way they get in new talent every single time. So try not to get discouraged and um, apply again if it's something that you really wanna do. I hope that answered your question. If not, comment below and I'll try better to uh, articulate an answer for that for you. Okay, the next question I have is, is it expensive to rent a booth area? Um, overall, I would say yes, it is expensive. It's definitely a commitment. Um, but with that said, it, it really, once again, depends on the fair, because I think you'll get like smaller, more local, more craft-based fairs, and those might be a bit more affordable to participate in. Um, but for the ones that I'm doing that really focus on fine art that are like in a metropolitan area, um, booths will generally start from like $1,500 and they can go up exponentially from there depending on the booth size that you have. And if you add additional lights, if you want to paint the walls, all of these things can, all of these things can add up and um, add to your booth expense. If I'm going to be brutally honest with you, I would say um, set the expectation that you might not make back the money that you've put into the booth and have that mindset going into it. Because I think if you're not really able to afford it, then you stretch yourself doing it and you're just completely stressed out the whole time and very like sales, sales, sales mind focused, you might sort of miss out on the experience. So I would go into it with an open mind, know, hey, you know what, I might not make back the money or I might only break even, but what else can I get out of this experience? And I think that you'll come off a bit more relaxed and maybe you will do better in sales as well as um, meet fellow artists and maybe get gallery opportunities. There might be post fair sales. You might get a huge commission after from one person that makes up your entire booth cost. It's just a very interesting experience and you never know what could come out of it. And I would say that if you learn that it's not for you, that's also something good to know. Okay, next question is, how do you find fairs to be a part of? Um, so for me, I usually see what fellow artists are up to and I'll look into it. So if someone's like, hey, I'm participating in this fair over the next few days and it's something that maybe I haven't heard of, 
I'll try to go to it and check it out or I'll follow them on social media and see what the experience is like and then look into it myself and say, is this something that I can do? Is it something that seems appropriate for me? Uh, and that's kind of the way I approach it. Uh, I've also had the experience where I've been contacted by fairs to participate in it. Um, and so for that, I'll look at it and determine whether it's something I want to do or not. You can also search hashtags for art fairs and just Google art fairs and see what comes up. And um, who knows, you might see something that is the perfect fit for you and in your town. I would say that if you see a fair that you're interested in, sign up for their newsletter, follow them on social media, and then when they announce that they're accepting applications, you can look into it again and see whether or not you wanna apply. Okay, the next question. What do you do after somebody buys a piece? Do you have supplies to wrap it up? This is a great question. So in the case of the other art fair, they have a booth where there's complimentary um, wrapping as well as potential for shipping. So sometimes you'll talk to a client about a large piece and they'll say, I'm gonna buy this piece, but are you able to ship it to me? And in the case of other art fair, it's been good. I've been able to direct them to the booth where they can have that outside conversation. So you'll wanna make sure that the fair that you're in um, if they handle that or not. Uh, it might just be on the artist where they go, you handle all sales, you handle all wrapping of work. If anything needs shipped, you need to negotiate that with the person. So I would try and plan that out ahead of time. Something to keep in mind when you're in your booth, you're not really able to like keep packaging and stuff out. They'll probably want it to look very clean as well as you. You'll want it to look clean so it looks nice for you. So if you do have packaging and stuff, maybe investing in a table with maybe a tablecloth and you can kind of hide things underneath it like packaging. So if somebody buys a piece, you go, okay, great. And then you can lift up the tablecloth, take the piece down, wrap it. You have your tape and all of that available and um, you know, bubble wrap it and hand it off to them to take home. I know in the most recent case of the fair, when I had um, stuff from my drawing rack, I had it already foam core backed and um, in a, G clay bag ready to go. Uh, some people asked if I had a bag that they carry it in and I had to end up go get some from the complimentary shipping booth. So maybe if you have some smaller works like that, just having a few bags on hand, that way you can just pop it in, you know, throw your business card in there, any postcards you have and just give it to the person. That'll make things easier. Okay, the next question is, how much are people pricing their work for? What sells best for you? Um, okay. Well, two things on this real quick. Um, the first thing is everybody prices their stuff really different. And what I would say is for yourself, you need to make sure that you're pricing your stuff at a point that you will not feel cheated or disappointed when you actually do sell it. And having a number in your mind of how low you're willing to go is also good. I find especially on the last day affairs, people think that they can like haggle with artists and try and get pricing down. And you need to kind of know in your mind where you're comfortable going. Cause I've had people come up to me and like, you know, say, mm, is there any way to get this for less? And I've said, okay, well, what number do you have in mind? And then they've told me a number that's, you know, less than half of what I have listed. And I've had to say, I'm really sorry. Like I can't afford to do that, but here's a number I'm willing to go and give them that number instead and then see if they're willing to commit. Um, sometimes people will walk away, that's fine. Um, but I would say have a number in your head that you're comfortable with because yeah, you don't wanna sell a piece and then feel as if, I don't know, just feel like it didn't feel right, if that makes sense. Um, and then the second thing I would say is see if the fair has any guidelines on this because sometimes fairs will say, you know, you're not allowed to sell prints, it all has to be originals, or um, you're not allowed to sell things under $100. Um, so see if the fair has any guidelines as to like what their requirements are when you're pricing your stuff. Okay, with all that said, uh, in terms of pricing, it's good to have a range. So for me personally, what I do, so my drawing rack, um, that tends to be $100, um, like 75 to $100 is what I have on offer in there. So it's a little bit more accessible. It's stuff that isn't framed. They're smaller originals. Um, and it's stuff that people can just take to them. And it's like a good entryway point into people who are interested in my work, but probably can't afford one of the larger pieces yet. Then in terms of maybe canvases or um, 
works on paper that are larger and framed. I'll have a few sort of mid-range things, so like in the $500 range. And then I'll have a few larger pieces that can go from $1,500 up to $5,000. I don't think I've ever shown anything that's been over $5,000. So uh, let me see, I'm trying to think. So the most expensive piece I've ever sold was for $3,000. Um, but I've also sold several $1,350 pieces, like sold out a booth of like five of those. So, you know, something to keep in mind that even though you might not sell like your big, most expensive piece, you might have like multiple small pieces that are mid-ranged and that will equal up your cost anyway. So it's good to have a range that people can play in. In regards to what specifically sells best, that's a little bit hard to answer because it just depends. Um, I've sold works on paper that are framed. I've done canvas works. I've done custom cut pieces of wood that I've painted on, they've sold. I've done ceramics now. I've done um, stuff that isn't even framed in the drawing rack. So I've kind of had a range all over the place. So I think it just depends on um, what you're trying to show and uh, whatever makes you showcase the best, try to do that. Okay, the next question. What is the most expensive and the least expensive you've seen at a fair? Um, okay, that's also a good question. Um, so the most expensive that I remember is I had a booth mate at a fair who um, had only three pieces hanging, like a very minimal hang. And um, it was like three large um, resin pieces and they were $10,000 each. And that was it. There was nothing else in the booth, just those three pieces. Um, and my impression is they weren't trying to sell those. That was more to get gallery representation and to get noticed. So that was that particular artist's approach. Um, I don't believe any of the pieces sold during the fair from what I can remember, but potentially maybe they sold after, I don't know. Um, but I would say that that was probably the most expensive and like the boldest thing I've seen somebody do at one of these fairs. Um, but there could be somebody there that was more expensive. I, I don't know. Um, I just particularly remember that booth mate seeing those three pieces and they were $10,000 a piece. So that was, that was pretty neat. Um, and I'm trying to think, oh, the least expensive. So I've seen some people doing like digital prints like for $30 and things like that. Um, that's probably on the cheaper end where it's just like a digital print, it's not even editioned. Um, but some fairs don't like that and they might have rules against that. So make sure you look into it. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, the next question I have is, how was visitor attendance? Um, this is definitely something to think about. Um, I know for me in the most recent other art fair, it was sort of, you know, during this pandemic, but people are vaccinated now. Um, but I was still worried people might not come out because it was like, the, it was really my first event that I was doing in a year and a half since all of it began. Uh, and also it was in July and locally I know New Yorkers tend to leave for the weekend um, in July and like go to the, the shore or upstate. They don't tend to stay in the city. So I remember being very concerned about the turnout and whether people would attend. So um, depending on where you show, I would think about that locally. Like, is this a good time? Is the is there a particular holiday going on? Is there another event that might be taking people away from this? It's something you should definitely think about and consider when applying to a fair and looking at those dates. Is it during any sort of specific thing that would keep people away during that time? What I will say is that it was a very good turnout this time and I feel very fortunate for that. And I think it was a lot of people where similar to the artists ourselves, they were just excited to be out looking at art and participating in an event again. And this was sort of the first one that they were doing. So that was really nice. And that's it for now, friends. 
Give me a thumbs up if you thought this video was helpful. Subscribe if you want to see more artist tips as well as my life as an artist. And leave a comment below if I missed anything, if you have any additional thoughts to something I may said, I would love to hear it. So for now, from my studio to your home, stay well and stay inspired, my friends. I'll see you next time. Bye.